particular talk is something that um, I have a PhD in, and therefore it's hard to distill it down to only sound bites. Every, everything I want to say is backed up by thousands of hours of study, and I want to go into a billion little rabbit trails, but I don't want to do that. I need to paint for you a big picture, because most people, even sitting right here in the Florida Keys, don't even know what a coral reef is. Every time, and I'm not kidding, every time I read a newspaper article or an, a, 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 a magazine article about coral reefs, the person writing doesn't know what they're talking about. And they mix up coral and reef, the animal and the thing. It, it, oh, it's mind boggling. Anyway, um, I do have um, a little bit of experience in this field. I, I am a marine biologist by training, very well, um, very well accomplished marine biologist. Yes, I went into this field because I wanted to scuba dive. I sure did, but I ended up in the genetics lab. I was studying these animals, these beautiful, beautiful animals. And I was looking at the coloration. I said, why did these things have these colors? Because in biology, as a Christian, I follow this idea called form follows function. That is, if things are doing something, there's a reason for it. And if all of these corals across the world are these beautiful colors. There's got to be a reason for it. Well, I never figured out what the reason was. Never. I had 17 hypotheses. Each one of them had a contradiction. But I did figure out, after lots of chemical extractions, that these proteins or these colors were caused by proteins. This was not known yet. Now it's well known, but at the time, no one knew this. And once I realized that there's proteins, there's genes behind them. And this is when I transitioned into genetics. Because what I did was I stole the genes for these bright green and bright red proteins and engineered them into these fish. And that's when I got my doctorate. So really my background is in genetic engineering. Then that opens up a giant can of worms, doesn't it? Yeah, is that moral? That's another kind. That's actually, we're going to cover that in the next talk, what science can do and what we're allowed and not allowed to do. But this is my background. But yet, even so, as a marine biologist, I am faced with a stark problem, and that is you read the Bible, that first page claims that God created the universe not billions of years ago, and it claims that there's no common ancestry of all things, that God created distinct categories of creatures. That's a massive scientific statement right there, and it's something that all Christians have to struggle with, because when you look in the world, everything you're reading in media is telling us the opposite of the creation count. But we're going to focus here on one aspect of the creation account. We're going to just look at verses 21 through 23 of Genesis 1. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas. Now, we're going to be talking about a very small subset of these animals that are in the seas. Animals that make coral reefs. And it works like this. We have a group of animals. And the kingdom animalia is full of a lot of amazing things. But we're talking about a subset of animals. That is, just the little things that have stinging cells. Corals, jellyfish, hydras, sea anemones. That's the anemone. They, they have stinging cells, okay? But a subset of those are the flower animals. Anthozoa, flower animals. Those are... Corals, hard corals and soft corals. But soft corals don't make coral reefs. It's the hard corals. The scl sclera in um, scleroderma is a thing where you get hard skin, sclero. The scleractinia are the hard anemones. Do you know what the difference between a coral and a jellyfish is? This is a jellyfish. This is a sea anemone. This is a coral. Same basic anatomy. All these animals are very similar. One has an exoskeleton, one doesn't. One swims, one doesn't. So it's a big group of animals. But when we're talking about coral reefs, we have to talk about the ones that have a skeleton. And we're talking about, as far as I'm concerned, the most beautiful animals in the world. For a long time, scientists didn't know these were animals. They thought they were plants because they don't walk. But then again, if you're a scientist in the 1800s, how do you study something in the ocean? You have no way of getting there. You might dredge something up and put it on, a, on your boat and say, what's this slimy thing? You don't have a clear glass aquarium yet. 
You can put it in a you know, wooden bucket, I guess, but then you really can't see. It was really, really hard to study these things. It took them a long time to figure out, oh, these are animals. Beautiful and amazing animals. So what is a coral? It's a jellyfish-like animal that has an exoskeleton. Okay? Now, I wish newspaper reporters knew that basic science, but they don't. Corals and jellyfish are based on a specific body plan called a polyp. It's really amazing. It's just a, cent a circular thing with some tentacles and a mouth in the middle. But it's limited. There's not much you can do with that body plan. If you slice one in half, you see that they have a, an inside, a gut. Um, their mouth is also their anus, though. They only have one hole. So anything they can't digest, they just spit out their mouth again. And they have stingy cells, and they make an exoskeleton. I, there's a reef out, I don't know if it's still there. I mean, the reef is still there. I don't know if the coral is still alive. But the, the National Marine Sanctuary put a buoy on a patch reef out off of Key Biscayne. Um, Oh, 20 years ago, and they, we saw this new buoy as we're driving past. Like, what's that? So we anchored, we jumped in, and there was literally a little patch reef as big as this room, about that high and literally about this big. I'm swimming around it, and I realized it was one coral, one animal, but he's only that thick. His body had the surface area of this, but he was only that thick because of his exoskeleton had built up over time, produced what we call a coral reef. But it was really a coral colony. But it's not really a colony. I'll get to that in a second. Oh, here we go. Boom. This is a mushroom coral. This is about as big as a single polyp can get. Because if you think about it, they have to feed themselves through one mouth. You can't be this big and get all your food through your tentacles, passing, passing, passing to one mouth. It takes too long. You get very hungry. So corals are limited in their size because of this polyp shape. So what do they do if they want to grow bigger? Well, they have a couple options. One, they can squish and make their mouth longer. Or they can divide themselves up into one animal with hundreds of mouths. It's not a colony like a colony of penguins. We have a bunch of individuals. This is one animal. It's a very simple animal, so if you cut it in half, it grows into two. But if you set these things next to each other, as they grow, they'll merge back into a single animal again. But they know the difference. Two coral colonies of the same species next to each other will fight. They'll sting each other. But two coral colonies from the same coral will not. Uh, one of my uh, friends in grad school, she was studying... Um, uh, the reef just north of the Christ statue. Um, I mean, literally just north of it. It had, what? I think Grecian South. Okay, whatever's where, I just, uh, no, okay, don't, don't throw those names at me here. Um, anyway, we dove on this, this reef all summer long, and she was studying the Elkhorn coral, which is now gone. But she's studying the Elkhorn coral, and she took samples of all of these coral colonies from this reef that was probably as big as your property here. And we went back to the lab, and I did all the extractions, and she ran all the DNA stuff, and she found out that that was one colony. She, every single coral on that reef had the same exact genetic pattern. It was one animal that had broken in storms and landed and regrew another colony. So these are very simple animals, and they have very interesting ways of reproducing. They can reproduce by breaking. They can reproduce by, you know, eggs and sperm. Some of them, you, have you ever been out on the reef during coral spawning season? At night, it's amazing. But other ones, they release little, um, a little planula larvae. They, they grow inside their bodies and they release them. The little things swim around and they land and they grow into a new, a new animal. Fascinating. This is my favorite coral in the world, Dendrogyrus cylindris. I've only seen a few of these. It's a pillar coral. Uh, last summer, I went diving on pillar coral reef. They're all dead. It's just pillar corals, skeletons, left behind, so there's still some coral reef structure there, but the, the corals themselves were gone, very sadly. But I love that guy. I spent a lot of time culturing these at the University of Miami. I grew dozens of species in tanks. We had the long spine sea urchins in there, and I just, I just had the, the best time studying these fascinating animals. But one of the other things amazing about them 
is the fact that they are farmers. These animals are active predators. They will grab anything swimming by and eat it, but they're also farmers. They house millions of algae cells inside them. So they're sitting under the sun. The algae are photosynthesizing and producing sugars. And the corals are using the sugars as energy source and doing all, everything the coral can do. Interestingly, a coral is at the base of the food chain. Lots of things eat coral, and then lots of things eat the things that eat coral. So they're capturing energy from the sun, turning into biomass, which becomes sharks eventually. What happens when the coral reef dies? You get less biomass. You get species change because the species that like to eat coral aren't there anymore. By the way, your reefs are gone. You know that, right? I remember when I got here um, to uh, 1996, I got to graduate school, and the old timers, you know, people 10 years older than me, they were telling me all these stories of things I would never see. By the time I was done, eight years later, I was telling the younger guys things that they would never see. And now 15 years later, you want to ask Coral Reef, you got to go to Belize now. Now that I'm getting ahead of myself. One reason for this is that after Noah's flood, Coral Reefs flourished at high latitudes. The Florida Reef Track is, a, is very far north compared to the other reefs in the world. It's cold up here. It's not great for coral reef growth. In fact, coral reefs used to grow way up, up, up the east coast of Florida. And over thousands of years, they've been pulling back. And now we're at the edge here. And boop! You want a nice coral? Go to South Cuba. I've never been there, but I've heard it's beautiful. Sorry, I've got my finger on the right button here. When most people think of coral, they think of a skeleton. I've got skeletons on my desk. I've got skeletons on my shelf. You know, all the curio shops, they sell coral. That's not coral. That's just a skeleton. Just like, um, how many of you have, have clamshells at home? Seashells? How much do you know about the animal that used to live in the shell? By the way, never pick up a cowrie. Roll it over and check really carefully. Cowries have poisonous harpoons. And if that animal is withdrawn into a shell because he's washed up on the beach and you pick it up, he might go, pow! <laughs> oh, you'll never pick up another one. Anyway. <laughs> These animals do have a skeleton. This is one that grew in my lab. We would take a hole saw on an air drill on a, a scuba tank and go down and go, boom! <laughs> and drill into the coral with a two-inch hole saw, and that would fit into a two-inch piece of PVC. And you could put that PVC cap with the coral in it in your fish tank, and it would grow. And it worked great until one day I collected one that had a disease, and I put it in my tank, and it wiped out every member of that species in my tank. All the other species were just fine. But literally, two days later, they're all dead. I was like, oh, man. I grew this guy for like three or four years. But if you zoom up on the skeleton, you see all these beautiful little details. This, by the way, is the reason why if you bump into a coral while you're scuba diving, it will shred your skin. Because these little needle and razor-like calcium carbonate things in there. But you know, as we dig and we learn about these animals, I want to shout with the psalmist, the psalmist, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hand, I sing for joy. This is one of my favorite verses in graduate school as I'm slaving away you know, studying, 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 studying. I could fall back on this and say, I'm studying God's creation and I could rejoice in that. Or else I would have gone crazy. Okay, so that's what a coral is. What is a coral reef? Well, that depends on who you ask. Hence more confusion. See, for me, a coral reef is a community of organisms. Fish, sponges, algae, corals, things like that. There could be a 50-year-old lava flow in Hawaii and as far as I'm concerned, that's a coral reef. It has exactly the same community of organisms as a thousand-year-old you know, atoll in the central Pacific. Same animals, same species, same interactions between all these things, but a geologist uses a different definition. A geologist looks at a pile of calcium carbonate in the rock record and say, it's a reef. They might not say coral reef, but they'll say reef. I'll get into that in a little bit. There are massive reefs in the fossil record that have no corals in them. Oh, 
So it's confusing. Worse, the term comes from navigation. A reef is something a ship can hit. It can be made of clams, it can be made of sand, it can be made of rock, it can be made of coral, it doesn't matter. It's something just under the water that your ship might run aground on is a reef. That's where it comes from. And now biologists and geologists have split the definition. And we've had to struggle with this a little bit. But let me give you a definition of it. Here's my definition. A coral reef is a large pile of calcium carbonate secreted by corals and algae and clams and a few other things. That's what a coral reef is. I remember in, um, I was taking a PhD level uh, course in marine biology. And I'm not going to say the guy's name because he's probably there, but the University of Miami. PhD level classes, only 12 of us and a professor, maybe six of us, I don't know how many of them, not many of us, all these uh, coral reef PhD students. And a professor in the middle of his lecture said, oh, let's face it, Florida's just one big coral reef. I wasn't going to let him get away with that. I said, oh, Dr. Blank, um, Florida is about a mile thick of chemically deposited limestone. And on top of that, in a few places, is a crust of bryozoans and corals. And he goes, oh, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right, okay, you got me. So he's saying Florida's a big coral reef because he's confused in the geologies, people in geology who are looking at calcium carbonate in a tropical area and say, oh, there's a coral reef. It's not. There's no corals in Florida. That giant mass of limestone with all the sinkholes and all the drinking water up, up in north, you know, the, the rest of your state, it's just chemically deposited limestone in the same way that the walls of the Grand Canyon have lots of limestone. We don't even know how limestone forms. There's massive amounts of limestone around the world. It's not produced by organisms. It's a mystery. I think it's a flood-derived product, but even so, no one knows how it forms. When you look at a map of where coral reefs are found, they're found within what's called a 20-degree isotherm. That is, places where the water rarely dips below 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The waters out here get colder than that. I know. It is miserable to scuba dive in January when the air is 60 degrees and the water is 60 degrees and you can't see your hand in front of your face. Someone hands you a cup of coffee on deck, you know what you do with it? You go like this. Oh, thank you. Who cares what your wetsuit smells like after that? You're freezing cold. This is a marginal environment for coral reefs. And it should not be surprising that our reefs here are struggling in the environment in which they live. Okay. But you'll notice also that on the west coast of Africa and the west coast of South America, coral reefs don't grow even though it's close to the equator. And that's because in the oceans, you have big currents circulating down on the west coast of, of South America, specifically and going north. That's why the waters of the Galapagos Islands, which are on the equator, are cold. It's because of the, the southerly currents. You also notice that in the Persian Gulf, there's a little white spot. The waters there are too hot. This relationship between the animal and the algae only works in a small temperature band. A little bit too warm, the algae photosynthesize too much and the corals kick them out and they turn white and the corals often die. A little bit too cold and the algae don't photosynthesize enough and the coral would have to feed the algae or forget that. You want a free lunch, you don't have to feed your, your, your things you're trying to farm. And that's why it breaks down. Hey, you're learning a lot, aren't you? Okay. Also, though, we have to split the difference between corals and coral reefs. There are deep water corals in cold, dark water, including off the north coast of Scotland, all over the world. And they make these vast fields of branches. They're very thin, they're very fragile. Um, you know, a trawler would go through and just rip the whole thing to shreds as, he, as he's trying to trawl the, the bottom. But these are not coral reefs because they don't accumulate to a gigantic brick-like structure over time. They're tenuous, they're, they're, they're little things. And so really when we're talking about coral reefs, the challenge is how do we explain the Great Barrier Reef in a few thousand years? That's the challenge. It's not how do we explain the things living on the north, co north coast of Scotland in deep water. There's something else we have to deal with. This is actually published in Creation Magazine. And I've told everyone this is wrong. This is published years ago. That is Pasolopra damacornis coral. It's a weed. It grows really fast. You could take this, put a glove on your hand, and you could crush the skeleton. 
It does not produce a heavy, thick skeleton. It grows really fast. We had these in our, our lab at UM. I literally had to take a chisel every couple of weeks and chisel away the corals growing on the drain pipe. Or they would have blocked the drain. They grow so fast. We started with 25 little sprigs. And two years later, I had thousands upon thousands of them. And my, my, the way I did it, I would take a pair of pliers, break it off, put a piece of crazy glue on a rock, and, and it would just grow. And I'm, they multiplied like crazy. So the question of how fast does a coral reef grow, we can't appeal to the fastest growing corals. Oh, they grow at a foot a year. Therefore, coral reefs grow at a foot a year. No, coral reefs do not grow at a foot a year, even if some corals do, because the other corals don't. And... There are fish eating the corals that are growing at a foot a year. So coral reef growth is the accumulation of the coral growth minus how fast they get eaten and how fast storms break them and how fast they erode and dissolve. Because corals do dissolve. The, the skeleton, the aragonized skeleton is very soluble in seawater in some ways. Okay? So our big challenge really is to explain something like the Great Barrier Reef. Anyone want to take a guess how we explain this? Is it that daunting? Let me give you a hint. The Great Barrier Reef is not very deep. Corals in the Pacific specifically do not grow 100 feet, 200 feet down. The Great Barrier Reef is shallow. The reason the reef is there is because it's an underground limestone ridge that the corals are growing on. The same is true in the Florida Keys Reef Track. There's a crust of corals growing on top of limestone. It's the same limestone that's in central Florida. The reason the reef is there is because there's a place for the corals to grow after the flood. Hmm. So we don't need thousands upon thousands or even millions of years. for the, In fact, in the evolutionary model, there was an ice age that ended about 10,000 years ago. During the ice age, water levels were about 300 feet lower than they are today. There was no Great Barrier Reef 10,000 years ago. It was dry land. So if they think the whole Great Barrier Reef grew in 10,000 years, great. I say the whole thing grew in 4,000 years. Twist my arm. It's about the same number. In fact, the Great Barrier Reef isn't growing anymore because it reached sea level. It stopped growing. It can't grow anymore, and it can't get wider. And the reason for that is as a reef gets wider, it, it starts build, building a, a hill. And as, as all the shallow water is taken over, how do you grow wider? You ha you'd have to grow coral reef from 300 feet down all the way to the surface. So what happens, in fact, I've done this um, in Belize. You jump in this absolutely gin-clear water. It's 80 feet deep, and you can swim out over the 300-foot drop on the edge of the reef. It's straight down, and you can see murky blue blocks, which are coral fragments that have fallen off the edge of the reef and fallen down and died. It would take forever for enough things to fall off and pile up that the edge of the reef would grow sideways. So we don't have to explain massive deep growth of reefs. We just have to explain how things grow on the cap of something. And I think we can do that pretty easily. Because corals are limited by sea level. This unbelievably fascinating place in West Australia, during a full moon, low tide, with an offshore wind, the entire coral reef comes above sea level. Now, if this happens in the middle of the day, a lot of these colonies will be baked and the tops of the colonies will die. So they, they, don't, they don't grow any taller. This is the absolute limit. Okay, so how does a coral reef grow? This is something uh, from one of Charles Darwin's books, 1842, The Structure and Origin of Coral Reefs. If I ever teach a coral reef class, I'm probably going to have all my students read his book because it's an amazing book. Here's a future scientist. He's a young man. He's traveling around the world, and he keeps visiting all these coral reefs, and he has no idea how they form. He, so he's speculating like crazy, maybe this and maybe that and maybe this. And it's a fun romping ride through this young man's exploration of crazy things. And so he comes up with this idea. He said this, because back then Darwin thought... In fact, until he died, Darwin thought, according to this um, Lyellian geology that we had in the 1800s, that is, continents rise and sink very slowly over millions of years. And that's why there's clams on top of mountains, because the continents sunk. Clams grow, and then the continent comes back again. 
Today, no one believes that. Today, people believe in horizontal tectonics, and it's the horizontal movements that crush things, that push things up. Okay, but this is Darwin's idea back then. He's got this mountain underwater, and on the fringe, uh, just to the left of that arrow, on the fringe, some corals are growing. And then what happens is, over time, the mountain starts to sink. And if it goes slow enough, the corals can keep up with that growth, and they would form a ring with a lagoon. And give it enough time, maybe sea level would go above the top of that mountain, and then you have an atoll, a ring of coral with a hole in the middle. This is completely wrong. No one believes this anymore, but we see this often. In fact, um, I just went on, online and grabbed a couple examples. There's tons of examples, including cute little animations of how this works. But it's not true. You've seen stuff like this probably. Have you ever thought about it? It's not true. In fact, um, the depth of the atoll depends on how much rainfall the area gets. Because rain dissolves calcium carbonate. So if you go to an atoll with a really deep lagoon, it's not millions of years old. It gets a lot of rain. If you go to an atoll with a shallow lagoon, it's not you know, less than the other one. It just doesn't get as much rain. And it's a, oh, that's a lovely correlation there between rainfall and the depth of the lagoon. So Darwin's hypothesis was incorrect, even though lots of people like to say it. So why am I doing this? Why are we studying this? It's because we want to be able to talk to people about our faith. We want to be able to have a rational reason for believing in what we believe. The Bible in 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So even though I just said Charles Darwin was wrong, I complimented him first. Harsh and sarcastic facts shouted in anger only make you look like a jerk. They don't usually point people toward the kingdom of God. But if you want to be able to answer things, it's sometimes it's nice to have something in the background and say, oh, by the way, Coral Reeves fit Noah's flood better. What? Yeah, and then has have a very interesting conversation after that. So our challenge is to explain something like this. How do we do it? And tell you what, here's our time frame. We have about 6,000-ish years, a little more than 6,000 years. The problem is the flood happened maybe 24, 2500 BC. So we've only got 4,500 years because coral reefs have to grow after the flood is over because there are no coral reefs in the fossil record. Say that again. There are no coral reefs in the fossil record. There's nothing like a modern coral reef anywhere on earth. There are corals, but no massive structures like we see. In fact, the biggest coral I've ever seen is at, in front of a university in, um, in Germany. The fossil coral, it's about this big. I have no problem that coral growing between creation and the flood. But there's nothing like we see, like the Florida Keys, Great Barrier Reef, those don't exist in the fossil record. And if we put this into a flood context, on the left, a basic schema of Earth's history. We have creation week on the bottom. About 1,700 years between creation and the flood, a one-year flood, and about 40, I'm going to say 4,500 years since then. Where do we put coral reefs into this picture? Well, we can have lots of corals growing before the flood, but I don't see it. And then we have this massive stage in the flood where we have a giant inundation and giant recession of the water, which has caused massive amounts of erosion and massive amounts of silt. And I don't think corals are going to like this. However, when the flood, I'm skipping here, when the flood is over, we have thousands of years for the earth to settle down. And for some reason, I don't know why, but when the flood was over, corals loved the oceans. It was the right temperature, the right, right amount of food, the right amount of calcium carbonate, and they grew like weeds, even in places where they can't grow today, like off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. Hmm. And things like this grew after the flood. Now, I found this under Golden Gate, Florida. I was driving to, uh, to my parents' house, 
and I, I went past a, um, a subdivision that was being built, and they were, had a backhoe, and they were digging a lake. I said, whoa, because I knew it was underneath there. So it was a Saturday, no one was there. I just pulled onto the property, and I'm walking around. And sure enough, they had this big pile of rocks and a rock crusher. They were crushing the rocks to make driveways. And I just walked up to this pile and said, whoop, coral colony, whoop, coral colony, because they were digging through the old coral reef. That guy, this, this coral, still grows here in Florida. That's the star coral, Orbicella faviolata. It used to be called Montastra faviolata. They changed the name on me, crazy. Anyway, amazing, amazing, amazing. There's another place that you might be familiar with. Has anyone ever seen this? Yeah, Winley Key. Winley Key, the, 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 um, the Key Largo limestone, is a coral reef. Clearly, if you zoom up on it, you see all these corals. The corals that still grow here. In fact, based on the animals that used to be growing, this reef probably was developing in about 30 feet of water. Cool. It's not shallow corals. It's not super deep water corals. It's the middle ones. When did this happen? When did this grow? Because clearly this grew. It's not an accident. It's a coral reef. When? Well, it's sitting on top of a lot of chemically deposited limestone down there that would have been deposited during Noah's flood. There's no fossils in that material. Just who knows how it forms. This formed after the flood. There's a band of sand dunes in Georgia down the middle of our state. It runs from Texas to New York City. A band of sand dunes with shark teeth in it and shells. It's at 80 feet elevation, and it is the old shoreline. After the flood was over, the flood water, the, the water levels in the oceans were about 80 feet higher than today. Florida was underwater. The Florida Keys were underwater. You had a coral reef growing here in the ocean that we're now standing on top of. And then the Ice Age started. The Ice Age lasted for a few hundred years. It was the heat from the flood, all that volcanism things that led to all the evaporation, that led to all the, the snow and ice falling on the continents. Well, when that started, about the water sea level dropped about 300 feet, leaving everything that was living in the first few centuries after the flood above ground. And then a little bit of rainfall and it redissolution and re-cementation and this, this coral reef turned into a giant block of rock. In fact, if you look at the geology of Florida, Florida is a very wide limestone platform. That coral that I just showed you came from there when Florida was underwater. This is the, um, the Florida, the uh, sorry, the Key Largo limestone with corals in it, just like the other place from the other, the other place. This is where I used to live in Miami. Miami is a bunch of sandbars that fuse together. When they first settled Miami, one of the first places in Miami to settle was Coconut Grove. Why? Because it was a high point. There was less mosquitoes. And they settled the high land before they drained the swampy land. They're on top of all the old sandbars. In fact, it's made of this stuff called oolite. I just picked up a piece yesterday. Down the other end of the Seven Mile Bridge, and there's all this key logo limestone that they dumped there for a breakwater. And I'm looking at the original rock, and there's this oolitic rock, and I picked it up. What it is is these spontaneously formed sand grains. When water gets warm, calcium carbonate is not soluble. It precipitates out. And if there's a little grain in the water, it'll, it'll get a coat of calcium carbonate. And then another coat, and another coat, and another coat, and it turns into a sand grain. It can literally snow in hot water as these sand grains that are just being formed fall out of the water column. And that is what the lower keys are made out of. Oolitic sand, just like Coconut Grove and other places in Miami. In fact, the Bahamas are made out of them too. The Bahamas are like a mile or more of sand that was spontaneously snowed out of, the, out, of the, out of the oceans because the water got too hot and the calcium carbonate wasn't soluble anymore. The, the fossil record is really weird because there's a lot of calcium carbonate in the fossil record. And it's 
weird also because we have a hard time explaining where it came from. But the oolitic sands, we think we know where they came from. They came from hot water. Okay. So if I showed you a picture of the extent of the ice age, this is the black areas are areas that were covered by ice during the ice age. Notice that eastern Siberia is not covered in ice. What? Thousands and thousands of elephants called woolly mammoths lived in Siberia during the Ice Age. It's too cold for them today. Elephants can't live there. They lived there during the Ice Age? Yeah, because the Ice Age was actually warmer. The Arctic Ocean wasn't frozen. There's an island, a chain of islands about 100 miles off the north coast of, of Siberia. It's littered in elephant bones. Because woolly mammoths used to live in the Arctic Ocean. What? What I'm getting at is this. The ice age is not an ice ball earth. There are still coral reefs. There's still tropical forests. There's still warm areas. It's just what happened is the, the temperate zones grew and the tropical areas decreased. But there's still plenty of warm places in the world. And during all this ice buildup, water level dropped. If you get in a submarine and you go to the Great Barrier Reef and you go down about 300 feet you'll see an old beach. The waves have etched a, a, a shelf in the limestone because that's how deep the water was, the, the surface of the water was. And then it came back up to today. In fact, sea level today has been very constant throughout the modern time period. Everyone's worried about sea level rise. Ah, you know what? Maybe we were dumb in building all of our major cities in the world right at sea level because if you look at history, sea level has changed a lot. And honestly, I'm not some uh, global warming nut. However, there's one particular ice shelf in, in Antarctica. It, it's a massive ice sheet, and it's sitting on the bottom of the ocean. There's no water under it. it it's just so thick, it squeezed all the water out. And it, it runs out, and it goes over an underwater mountain chain. That's, you know, very, it's not very deep. And then the ice from there sheets out over the ocean. And it, the, the edge of that ice sheet does this. If it ever melts back to before that underwater mountain range, the ocean will get underneath it and float it. Earth's sea level will rise about a foot and a half from that one thing. One big glacier, a foot and a half sea level rise. We will never build a hospital or a highway for the next 50 years because every dollar we have is going to go to, be, to build a wall around Miami and Washington, D.C., and Boston, and New York, and Los Angeles. Oh, my. That's going to be a lot of money. So the environment is very important, and we need to pay attention. Can we do anything about it? That's the second question, but we do need to pay attention. If we're looking at the fossil record, we want to explain where we find corals. Well, we're going to struggle. Because first of all, way deep in the fossil record, in the Paleozoic era, there are coral-like things, but they're not modern corals. Um, the corals that we have are called hexacorals. If you look at the skeleton, there are six main divisions, and sometimes 12. The corals in the deep, 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 deep fossil record are pentacorals. The corals we have have an aragonite skeleton. The ones from the Paleozoic had a calcite skeleton. Still calcium carbonate, but two different forms. They had a different biochemistry. They had a different shape. They're not the ancestors of corals we have today. But the, the corals from the, the Paleozoic are extinct. Horn corals, tabulate corals. There are other random things that we don't even know. They're just little pieces of stuff. They call them corals, but we're not even sure. But, sorry, point was, notice the two brackets. There's a break there. Modern corals show up in the Triassic. That's funny. At the same time, mammals show up. It is before dinosaurs. But okay, besides that. Um, modern corals show up and they're throughout the entire um, Mesozoic and on into the modern era. But we still, we don't see coral reefs. And the reason is the time is not there. If you have corals, you should get coral reefs. But you don't. Because it didn't really, the millions of years is actually not there. I was a, um, had a roommate at one point, he's from Germany, and he had taken a, a trip with a geology class to, um, to one of the mangrove islands just off of Key Biscayne. And he comes back and he's hopping up and down with excitement. He goes, I can finally explain the coral reefs of Germany. I said, what? 
What coral reefs of Germany? He goes, yeah, where I lived, farmers were constantly plowing up corals in their fields. Really? Well, it turns out that the corals are growing, that they're finding, are corals that grow off, off here in very shallow water in the seagrass beds. So he goes, my answer is, this area of Germany was a bay that must have connected to the Mediterranean. And it was very muddy. And this same exact types of corals, these branching parietes corals were growing there. And then I said to myself, yeah, a few thousand years ago, for a few hundred years, then the water level dropped. And now they're marooned. But I didn't tell him that because, you know, I was shy. All right, let me give you a couple of case studies. These are challenges. In fact, I went to say, here's the three things that I want to discuss. And then I, I found out that the old age creationists and the young age creationists had both argued about this over several decades. So I think I picked up a couple of good examples. One, the oil reefs of Canada. When people are looking for oil in Canada, they drill down. If they find a reef, and I'm putting it in scare quotes here, if they find a reef, there's oil underneath it. Because the calcium carbonate, or the salt, caps it, and the oil can get trapped, and that's where they drill. Now, this actually, um, I'm pulling from Dan Wonderly's uh, book, God's Time Records in Ancient Sediments. I completely disagree with this guy, but I'm using his examples anywhere. I remember I was in, um, in a marine geology class, and I asked a world-famous marine geologist. I said, Dr. X, I know all these examples of corals on the surface. We're studying coral reefs. They're all right here, right near the surface of the water. I can explore them. I don't have any examples of coral reefs in the fossil record. Do you know of any? And he stopped and he thought. And he knocked his earpiece off. And he thought and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, the reefs of Canada. They use them for oil prospecting. I said, oh, he got me. Then years later, I realized that these reefs aren't reefs. If you do a cross-section of this area, you can see some pinnacles. You see those three pinnacles? Well, if you contract, if you squish it this way, they look like they actually stick up. But if you stretch it out to the real size, they're, they're, they're like this. It's not a pinnacle. It's not a reef, but the geologists are calling it a reef. There's no corals there. In fact, there's no structure. To get a coral reef, you need things to weld together a structure. This is mud. It's a calcium-rich mud that the geologists are assuming was formed. But they don't say coral. See, they just say reefs. They don't say coral reefs. It's, yeah, you need a structure worse. This, the brown material there is what's called halite. It's alternating bands of sodium chloride, sodium, uh, calcium carbonate, and calcium magnesium carbonate, which is also called dolomite. Millions and millions of these bands. And what they say is that every time the ocean evaporated, it formed those three bands. Well, wait a second. You have a reef growing in an area where the ocean keeps evaporating? No animal can survive that. You're not going to get something. And plus, you'd have to have this reef grow at the same rate as all this stuff is building up around it. This is a toxic environment. In fact, there's no evidence that, this, uh, that these banding patterns are actually produced by an evaporating ocean. Because there's no fish. There's no other things you would expect. Nope, oh, skip here. How about this for an example? Maybe these little things that we see, these giant things, these mounds we see, have been squeezed up from below. We have examples of that. It's called a fluidization pipe. Here's one in Africa. This brown material is made of one thing, but the girl standing next to something that's made of the stuff under her feet. It has been squeezed up through a crack. Wait a minute. That means the material under her feet was not solid rock. And this other stuff was laid on top of it, and the pressure squeezed some of it up, like toothpaste. Oh, oh, that's cool. Here's another example. The Capitan Reef. Notice about reef in quotes. Is it a reef? Well, from what you know, what do you think I'm going to tell you? Is this a coral reef? No, is it a reef? A reef needs structure. This is mud. But if you look at, a, at, at the, uh, the area, it looks like it has a lagoon. If you look at it sideways, it looks like it has, has reef-like structure, wave-created patterns. But again, 
See all these bands? That's the halite. There's no reef here. You don't get reef in in an evaporative area. But there are sponges in here. And the sponges, the, the, they, what they've done, they, they take the, the rocks and they cut them and they look at them. And if they find a circle, that's a sponge. They find an oval with a sponge lying on the side. And they said, most of these sponges are upright. Therefore, this was an intact sponge reef. The thing is, as someone pointed out later, wait a minute, half of your ovals are actually upside down. Half your circles, I mean, half your circles are upside down. Therefore, if you take out half of your upright ones, the coral, the sponges are random. They've been washed and piled up in this giant mud bank that then petrified and became the Capitan Reef. It's not a reef. In fact, Ariel Roth, um, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, works at Loma Linda University, and he's a coral guy. He writes this, he goes, one of the main problems with the traditional reef interpretation of the Capitan Reef Complex is a lack of reef frame builders. It's not a reef. The massive reef core consists mainly of fine calcium carbonate mud. The robust, wave-resistant reef frame builders of our present reefs are missing. Why do I say all that? Because we don't need to be daunted. The third example I want to give you is an Iwataka Toll, which famously got blown up by the US government by nuclear bombs. But before they blew it up, they drew two deep cores in the reef structure, and they went all the way down until they hit the volcano. This giant atoll, which is about a mile thick, is sitting on top of a volcano. Oh, well, there's several different ways we can explain now. How do we get a mile thick reef to grow in like 4,000 years? Can we do that? Well, you only need uh, how, how, uh, 5,000 feet of reef growth in 4,000 years. That's about a, a little over a foot a year. But some corals can grow that fast. But remember when I said it's not the rate of coral growth? It's coral growth plus how much is being eroded. But something weird has happened here in, I- in Iwatak. Sorry, I'm skipping here. That is this. The currents are so strong that... Have you, ever seen a, have you ever been scuba diving or snorkeling and seen a parrotfish? What happens when you spook the parrotfish? He swims away and he poops out a cloud of powder. What is that? It's sand. He's been munching on corals and grinding them up, and a lot of the the sand on your beaches is actually parrotfish poop. This is the way it is. They produce a lot of this material that fuses together to make rock. Well, the currents here are so strong that anything falling off the fore side of the reef is washed back up onto the reef. So the rate of reef growth is not how fast corals grow, it's how fast sediments pile on top of the reef. Oh. Oh, it's a sandbar. That's what this is. The sandbar with lots of beautiful corals growing on it, but we don't have to be stuck, stuck with that old idea. Plus, since it's a volcano, there might be some latent heat, and that heat might be causing convection currents through the reef core, which is sucking calcium carbonate in from outside and depositing it on the inside. So now we have a way to fuse it together. Huh. Okay, last section. The fate of coral reefs. This is Florida. All of those lumps and curves and bulges used to be coral. And now they're dead. And it's very, very sad. How do we deal with this without becoming eco-Nazis? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. This is after Adam rebelled against God and, Adam, and God says, Cursed is the ground for your sake and toil you should eat of it all the days of your life. But it's not just the dirt that's cursed. In Romans 8, if you read Romans 8, there's multiple references to creation. It is clear that Paul is teaching the entire universe is being weighed down by the weight of Adam's sin. He says, we now, the, we, before we know it, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. That's just one, one phrase about creation in this whole long passage, which creation is in decay, creation is in decay, creation is in decay. The whole creation is in decay. So we have one explanation here. That is, coral reefs are under the curse Environmental degradation should be predicted by the Christian model here. Now, that doesn't mean we should wantonly go out and destroy the environment. We should treat it very well because it's been given to us. See, God said um, to Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God put the environment in our care. Therefore, we should make wise choices. And one of the wise choices we're making right now is we are decarbonizing our economy. Now, that's not just the, the, the leftists who are pushing that. It is wise to do this. In fact, um, I just heard about a brand new invention which is going to change your life. They've invented, in fact, the guy who, his guy's name is John B. Goodenough. Love that name. He invented computer memory. He invented RAM. 10 or 15 years later, he invented the lithium-ion battery. Lithium-ion battery, anyone? I'm sure I'm glad we're not using those lead-acid batteries for this. It would be impossible. Lithium-ion batteries, lithium-ion lithium ion batteries are driving our modern economy today. Electric cars, same thing. But he just invented a battery that's made of glass. The problem with the lithium batteries is over multiple recharge cycles, the lithium will grow a, 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 a little tendril, and when it goes across the battery, it shorts it out and it's dead. You can't do that with a piece of glass. It's lighter, it charges faster, and it has more charge holding capacity. He just blew the battery out of the water, and all of a sudden we're talking about a thousand mile electric car that can charge in 10 minutes. And it's cheaper and lighter. That will affect everything we do. Anyway, so we should be engaged with environmental issues because they are important for us. But in the end, the environment's going to go to pot anyway. We know that. But at the end of the Bible, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There should be no more pain for the former things are washed away or have passed away. God is telling us that all of the suffering and degradation in the world now, which is a curse, is going to be removed and all things will be restored. Now, I do not believe that we're going to be floating on clouds with little harps. I think it's a very bad impression of what heaven is going to be like. Heaven is going to be a physical world that God recreates. He's going to recreate the world that was once fallen, restore it, and put us back in this paradisical-like place. And I think there's going to be coral reefs there. And I can't wait because if there's not scuba diving, I'm going to invent it in heaven. Anyway, there's a lot more material on this. I've got several articles on this on creation.com, including articles on um, coral reefs, ancient corals um, that some evolutionists like to use to prove that the earth had more days per year. It's not true. Millions of years ago. Um, just that you have to avail yourself. All right. I'm going to stop now. We're going to come back in a little bit. I have a more gospel message for you coming up, but I'm actually going to try to twist your brains with a lot of fun thought experiments to figure out how we know what we know and how do we apply that to the world and to talking to other people about the gospel. Thank you much. See you in a bit.